anybody. I'll take two or three. If you could say your name uh, and your institution and speak briefly to the microphone. <coughs> it's Ode Gorka from Ricardo A. I was very, uh, first of all, thank you for this uh, uh, great report. Uh, it's a short question on the um, uh, fossil fuel subsidies. I was very pleased to hear that uh, at the end of the presentation. I just wonder if, in case of the Moroccan experience, uh, if there's anything you can share about the difficulty or easy, the kind of lessons learned, how to shift these uh, subsidies because it's, it seems like it's still, it's kind of part of the big picture and without, you know, uh, removing the sub uh, subsidies, the power of the uh, fos okay. fossil fuel industry will never. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Any other yes, gentlemen here and John, two, two more, two here. Hello, I'm Esan Masood from the Science Policy Magazine Research Fortnight. A question uh, for you, Amalie. You, men you mentioned the finance ministries sort of playing a leadership role. Did you measure or did you count how many ministries of finance uh, are playing such a role within the countries that you assessed or evaluated? Okay, thank you. John. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thanks for great presentations and congratulations on the, uh, on the good result. A couple of questions to Jason and to uh, Sheila around the, uh, the economic impacts of uh, green growth measures. For example, in Morocco, what, what were the, the economic impacts of the, uh, of the changes uh, that you saw around the, uh, the solar and the shift uh, uh, in, in uh, uh, pursuing the 2% uh, uh, I think it was on, uh, on solar uh, energy? And to Jason, you mentioned um, poverty reduction efforts. Could you say anything specific about what the poverty reduction benefits were? Did you measure them, or were they modelled, or were they theoretical? Thank you. Okay, can I just add two um, questions that have come in from panelists uh, from from overseas that relate to that? Um, the one is, what's the impact of green growth on inflation? And an interesting question for economists amongst us. And secondly, a question that was from a colleague in uh, in Tunisia from WWF North Africa. And Maidu from Mauritius asks, are there areas where developing countries can be su particularly successful in achieving green growth? So I think it links perhaps to this John Carstensen from DFID and OECD hat you wear as well, John. Um, Amelie, some of those questions were direct. Oh Did yes. you want to start? Pick up the ones that uh, are most difficult. Um, Yes, well, I mean, on the fossil fuel subsidies, I'll probably let maybe Sheila wants to comment, but um, just to highlight the, the this really um, underscores the importance of governments having an exit strategy when they first introduce some form of subsidy, because presumably they were, they were first introduced for either social, economic, or probably both reasons, um, and then governments, <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> then governments get, you know, they become politically very difficult to remove. Um, and I think there are some interesting examples of how they are being removed because they do need to be, particularly where it's, um, it is a social and poverty reduction uh, objective, there needs to be alternatives, good alternatives that um, can be put on offer and, and um, made, uh, um, can, can develop uh, community um, voter support so that the, po the political challenges around those become less. But I know. Sheila's done quite a lot of work on, on this issue and may want to add. Um, in terms of measuring treasuries, finance ministry's involvement, we didn't measure that as such, but we did look at how finance ministries uh, were engaging and taking a role. And I think, um, I think what's important to emphasise, uh, although we're seeing a lot of good practice and good um, uh, progress being made, I don't think really any country is yet taking that very broad suite of... No, no, no well, I think you see, for example, in the case of Morocco, they're doing it for a particular sector, but not necessarily all their sectors. Um, in the case of in, in Europe, uh, Germany, for example, very good at um, uh, leadership and energy efficiency, renewable energy, but not necessarily covering the whole economy yet. But, you know, it's a, it was... A at the beginning of a process, really. So um, we didn't measure, but we definitely looked at the roles of finance ministries. In the case of Vietnam, the, the government, the finance ministry, were the ones who engage with um, the international uh, donor community as well as domestic stakeholders in bringing the, that community together around this issue. And that really is uh, a very critical function. 
Let me go down to Sheila and then Will and then back to Tracy. On the subsidy reform question, we could have a whole panel. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least I would enjoy that. Um, <laughs> I think really um, what Jason was talking about are some of the key areas that are the exact same kind of questions and issues that we're, you're talking about when you're talking about subsidy reform. So this linking of um, understanding the benefits, multiple benefits, that the benefits are not necessarily the most obvious ones. How do you communicate those? What's the analysis that has to go into that um, sort of benefit identification and communication? There's um, very good work that's being done by the OECD on subsidy analysis. There's very good work that's being done by Global Subsidies Initiative on reform processes. And they have manuals for sort of guidelines for subsidy reform. So I think that there's, you know, there's a, there, there's starting, and the World Bank and IMF and others have also been doing um, documentation of country case studies of subsidy reform. So there's beginning to be sort of an inventory, but I would say a lot of the, the same issues that come across here are the same that will come across in the, in the case of subsidy reform, and that those are also, they need to be linked to planning processes. So when there's an energy reform process happening or privatization process, all these questions need to come into play as part of that um, sort of long-term planning. Uh, on the question of economic impacts in Morocco, it's a good question. I'm not an economist. Um, the, I think, what we see at least now, I mean, these solar, the first large uh, concentrated solar power project, the deal was just, has just recently been closed in terms of the, the other private investors. Um, the, the project is not commissioned yet. Uh, we know that there are, the government, there is a government sort of financial burden for this power purchase agreement, which is, you know, which will be balanced against um, the, you know, the, the subsidy reform process that would allow that sort of budgetary burden to be diminished with an, an additional, and so then the question is, does that become an equal budget burden? Do you, do you have extra budget to, to invest other, in other places? There would be a hope that there may be more jobs and economic opportunities because of instead of importing energy, you would be producing it domestically. But I think all of that is still kind of, well, one, it's not something we looked at in detail, but also, also in terms of time frame, I think it will take time to tell. And I think it's sort of the same with these cases. We don't have a country that's done everything right. And also in a lot of cases, some cases are 20 years. So some of the work we did looking at payment for ecosystem services in Costa Rica, you might be able to say. But in terms of solar in Morocco, it's actually one of the shorter kind of cases that we've looked at. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone else has other yeah, thoughts. Will, do you want to? Brief comment. It was on another topic. I don't okay, know to no, let's let's move on. Did any comments on the? Yeah, it was uh, in response to the question that you came in over the web um, about uh, developing countries being a particular successful yes. uh, sort of model for green growth. I mean, I think in terms of potential, I think you can definitely see that. I was going to refer to a project that Ron mentioned. Um, that it was a follow-up to this, really, in Rwanda, um, being funded by the African Development Bank, which is trying to help Rwanda understand. Uh, essentially the costs of, of the green growth pathways. And it's an interesting country because it, I mean, it's starting from a very low level of uh, electricity access and, and there's mm -hmm. very sort of strong ambitions and targets linked into sustainable energy for all, for, for example, to, to grow that. And the question is how do you supply the electricity um, to, to achieve that? Um, I mean, at the moment, it's very easy to build diesel-fired uh, generators. It's the easy, quickest and easiest thing you can do. But getting diesel into Rwanda is right in the middle of Africa. It's just incredibly expensive. Um, and so doing something, doing the, um, s some of the renewable <laughs> options are actually cheaper in terms of u per unit of electricity and, and make a lot of economic sense, uh, which probably links into the, the other question about inflation as well. I mean, th these things are sensible things to do. Um, they're more complex technically. They take longer to implement, and they're more capital intensive. So just because it's cheaper in the long run doesn't mean to say it's cheaper in the, in the short run. You've still got to raise the capital, deal with the technical risks, et cetera. So um, you know, it's, it's not the case that the cheapest things necessarily get done. And I think those are the hurdles that uh, need to be overcome in those okay. sort of circumstances. Thank you. Jason, did you want to comment? Sure, I'll, I'll maybe focus on the poverty alleviation question, which I don't think was addressed. Yeah. Um, the so, the, I mean, the report lays out the benefits you should look for. We don't do a lot to assess where, where, where we've seen those benefits yet. But, but that said, I think it's important to point out that there's a number of areas where we're seeing the link to poverty alleviation coming out more and more strongly. And, you know, in the past, much of analysis has been about the rising cost of energy and the impact on the poor of that. But it's, I think it's a very narrow analysis, and it doesn't get to many things w in which there are positive benefits for, for the poor. So there's a lot, um, especially in developing countries, around uh, improved productivity of land use, right? So where countries are, are particularly uh, rural still. 
Um, there's numbers of examples of, of either long-term landscape planning, uh, better soil management, um, where you know the production per hectare can increase uh, you know, twofold, and you can get returns for those people on, on investment of, of you know 10 percent or more. I mean, a significant economic benefit combined with carbon sequestration, combined with um, uh, with uh, I guess with, with with a longer I guess longer term soil, soil productivity. So I mean, it's 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 less disruptive. There's lots of examples uh, where energy efficiency. Um, can be uh, can help reduce uh, energy bills, and of course, um, there's lots of examples around a better and more robust public transport, uh, which more the poorer populations tend to be more dependent uh, on public transport, and that can be a win for mobility, job opportunities, and for uh, obviously for environmental impacts. Um, and I think those aren't those aren't played up enough, and 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 they're actually quite significant and they're relevant to a broad a broad set of countries. And I would add as a as a small addition to that, when it comes to developing countries. Um, there, I think there's a lots of reasons to believe that uh, a, taking a green growth approach from the beginning is, is going to be beneficial. I mean, why as a country developing today would you do things the way countries did 50 years ago? Uh, why would you go th over a development pathway when you can learn the lessons uh, and the benefits? You know, air pollution is a, is a great example, right? I mean, every country from the UK decades ago through to China today have gone through the air pollution problem. You know. It's a it's a real shame that, that people don't just mm. do it right from the beginning instead of you know end up putting in policies ten or twenty years after they they're they're really needed. Thank um, you, Jason. Let's do another round of questions. I didn't really look very hard in this direction, but there's a gentleman here. If you can pass the microphone behind you, Charlotte, mm. and here. Hi there, Ryan Nazareth, uh, independent consultant and a project manager. Uh, Ron, I just want to focus on you know you made a brief point on trade-offs. And uh, anyone in the panel to just balance. W has there been a good framework for evaluating those tra trade-offs mm -hmm. within a green growth policy framework and preventing these countries from going down the path of you know it becoming green camouflage? Okay, there's another nice question. Yeah. Good afternoon. My name is Adeolu Udushote from Nigeria. Um, I'll be joining the newly constituted board of lead on Friday. That's why primarily, I mean, uh, London at this time. But I kind of heard about this meeting and I thought it was good to uh, maybe look at some of the things that are related with the work we're doing here. I was part of the uh, Action Lab program of CDKN in 2011. And out of that came a group that was looking at making a small package for green growth. It was called the Green Growth Guide. Somewhere along the line, I think that thing kind of snapped, and uh, it's, it's, it's not done to the end. I'm just asking this. Was this work able to, in any way, uh, get an awareness of whatever along the line that group did? And sitting here this afternoon, I'm quite amazed, because uh, I just feel we're quite naive in that group, trying to do what we thought we were going to do, uh, because of the kind of things that I've seen here today. and yet. I'm quite impressed and thankful that we had the opportunity to do some of the things we did because quite some of them were in the right direction. How can we make the best of such work that would look like otherwise we'd be wasted? And where are we exactly? I think Sam also will be aware of this and be able to tell us a bit more of that. Thank you. Okay, I've got two questions from uh, the, um, the distant participants that build on those. Um, one, Ron, from Rabinder uh, Kumar, NRI, given trade-offs and market failures, um, does that stop private sector leading and supporting these initiatives? So I think there's, a, there's also a related question about um, private sector willing to, to lead these initiatives, and do the case studies speak to that issue at all? Um, and then there's also a question about should we be developing standards of green growth practices, um, green economy, um, from uh, Mustafa at the Middle East and North Africa Renewable Sustainability Initiative. Um, so, Ron, I don't know whether you want to pick up on that. I mean, your, your reference to earlier work on green growth from CD Ken's point of view, this, that initiative, you're right, didn't go forward that we were referring to, but in a way, this is a much larger initiative that's grown out of that, and I suppose there's, there's a continuation. This is this report is only as good as the amount of time and resources we put into it, and there's a constant learning challenge here that we will continue to build on as best as we can. So I think, I think your point's well made about that sort of journey that we've been on. 
But Ron, do you want to talk a little bit about some of those issues about trade-offs and those issues? Yeah, th th thank you for those questions because uh, I think it really comes to the heart of the challenges and the debate about green growth. Um, I think there, there are, I mean, a number of countries um, um, that have uh, done good analysis and more importantly, good stakeholder dialogues and deep sort of uh, analysis and consultation on what the trade-offs are. So Indonesia, for example, as they've been working on this challenge of phasing out fossil fuel subsidies, gets back to this issue, has really done some interesting analysis of the costs and benefits of the phase out versus the social security systems that they need to put in place to compensate the poor and the political <coughs> dynamics associated uh, with that phase out. And so they had extensive consultations. There also was a lot of uh, analysis of the the costs and benefits that they went through, which have, you know, in their in their case, ended up with sort of a middle of the road. They haven't gone for a complete phase out. It's a gradual phase out with some social protection for the poor. Um, but I think it, it uh, that whole analysis and the consultations helped them understand the risks and the challenges and and, and what it would take. Um, and I, you know, I think um, I'm sure others, uh, Will and Jason, can comment more on the individual tools that countries have used, but. Um, you know, similarly, um, in South Africa, um, it was really the, the consultative process together with some uh, macroeconomic modeling that helped them understand the trade-offs um, associated with um, investment in a green economy, and 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 who the who the incumbents are that would be who would might lose market position and who might be who would then um, and have in fact um, been vested interests that have blocked change and who are the others that would benefit. So, and, and having that information on who benefits and having them part of the process so they can speak up uh, when those incumbents are trying to block change has, has been vital. And I think that's where, the, and, and that's where the private sector engagement has to come in. The well-designed processes bring the private sector in early into not only the um, sharing results with them, but actually having them be part of scenario development. Um, and, and South Africa did that from the get-go. They had the private sector in there identifying sort of where is it that the private sector can benefit, the, the renewable industry, the energy efficiency industry, the industries investing in um, protecting um, natural areas and tourism uh, and agriculture practices to help shape the scenarios and help identify sort of what the, the options are that will uh, increase private investment over time. Any other reactions in the panel on that? Any other questions from the floor? Yes. Uh, Julian, <coughs> can you pass the mic? Hi, Julianne from CDKN, actually. Um, and I've got a learning hat on today. Um, and I was wondering, given that you've collected this kind of lessons learned report, um, I was thinking there's a big gap often in implementing lessons learned into decision making and actions and, and policy processes. So how do you envisage that going forward with this report actually? Okay, that's a good open question. Yeah, one more here. Beata from the Climate Bonds Initiative. I was wondering um, specifically to you, Amali, if you had um, kind of made any conclusions about the difference between mobilizing investments in developing countries and emerging markets versus more developed countries? Mm -hmm. That's a nice specific question. I've got two questions from uh, a far afield that might be directed to, to you, Will. Um, one is, is there evidence from the study on absolute decoupling between economic growth, or, or will energy use and resource use and, and economic growth? So it's a very high-level question. Um, actually, the same person, Urban Naps, just resubmitted his questions. Were there any tools get being more specific around this issue of decoupling? So that's taking his high-level question more specifically. There's a, there's a lovely technical question from Jose Luis um, Saniego in ECLAC in Santiago de Chile, saying, in the case of Brazil, have energy efficiency-related projects identified how are energy efficiency related projects identified to get concessional funding and who sets baselines within each sector? So I don't know whether there's any of the case studies that have talked about baseline setting of energy efficiency and how that's happened. Brazil is asking quite a specific question there. Um, 
Will, do you want to start with the higher level and go to the specific, or just stick with the higher level? To you, but we're about to stop, so we can. Yeah, I mean, these the audience. the decoupling issue was not something we explored sort of uh, explicitly within the chapter. Um, the, uh, I mean, so my comments are sort of more <laughs> in terms of my own experience of of that, and I mean, it's it's a hard one to judge. I mean, personally, I think absolute decoupling makes it sound as if you have no resource sort of uh, constraints on, on the economy at all uh, and, and the, the economy is free to float wherever it wants to go without any resource implication. I mean what, what it tends to be used for is whether the, the sort of growth curve for economy is going in one direction and resource use is going in the other and you know there are quite a lot of e examples of that happening at least um, sort of temporarily through resource efficiency, energy efficiency and, and, and huge strides towards that and a lot of analysis. Um, there's something recently been done by the EU specifically on that to try and understand, it's, it's by the um, d d uh, com DG um, uh, competition, I think, to try and understand the drivers of decoupling in different countries in the EU. So that might be quite an interesting resource to look up t to see the tools that people use to try and understand whether the um, whether they're real efficiency measures, for example, or whether it's sectoral change, uh, in the energy example, it's sectoral change towards less energy intensive uh, industries, for example. So th those are very two very different types of response to, for example, higher energy costs. And it's important from a policy perspective to try and sort of understand what is driving that kind of decoupling, see you know, w what the trajectory for that is likely to be. Okay. Um, on baselines, there was a whole uh, a chapter sort of dedicated to baselines within the report, so I, I would point the okay. uh, questions to, to okay. that section. There's another question that's just come in on multiple levels of coordination between governments, and I think there's also a chapter that picks up mm. on that. So I think many of these questions we can't answer now, but can be delved from digging into the report. Emily, there's a specific question to you, and then I'll pass to Jason to wrap up with a few Hi. remarks. Hi, thank you. Yes, um, I mean, that's quite a a big question, so I'll just try and sort of touch on some elements of that. Um, we did well. We wanted to look at uh, different country context as well as you know regional technology uh, as well as the financing approaches. So we didn't divide developed versus developing countries, and and actually I think that was absolutely right as as we started to get into the case studies. Uh, initially, we thought we would uh, one of the key issues we wanted to focus down in was the role of international cooperation, which we thought would be more of a, a developing country issue. Um, as we looked into that, we realised actually that's important in developed countries too. I mean, you'd be aware of the Project Bonds Initiative that the European Investment Bank and the European Commission are leading um, to mobilise uh, capital for investments within the EU. Um, of course, the European Investment Bank has um, most of its activities are within the EU. So, um, we even in that context, we didn't see it useful nor necessary to try and differentiate between developed and developing countries. Uh, I think um, what was possibly surprising at, 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 at the beginning, but actually now in retrospect isn't, is the the fact that all countries, whether developed or developing countries will need to allocate um, uh, public resources through this of targeted financial instruments, um, which I think we we assumed, or perhaps I'd assumed initially, that in many cases um, the, the policy incentives and frameworks may be sufficient along with ensuring you align the economic signals and, and national budgets. But actually uh, the importance of aligning public uh, financial instruments that deploy public resources uh, in a very targeted and um, uh, transparent way is really important in mobilizing uh, other investors across the board. And I think the case of Germany, energy efficiency and housing in Germany, and KFW provided um, uh, concessional loans to banks the financial intermediaries and what was interesting I mean that 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 case study is she said is one of our mature ones 20 20 years um, it's been in process and actually that program and that government ac uh, use of public resources has cons over time evolved the the way in which the finance has been deployed has evolved over time how they create transparency for example KFW publishes the interest rate so that 
domestic householders know whether their bank's adding a big premium and you know so that and that's that's that was you know 20 years in the making and it you know a, a good example of uh, the importance of using these targeted public resources um, effectively which I think we possibly underestimated that initially for developed countries but it became clear that it's critical for across the board can I, sorry, can I add to that just really, really quickly? Um, I think we, we also find that for, as opposed to develop versus developing, as Amelie said, that it's also very sector specific. Um, and the level of, there's often this, when people use the word mobilize, they're actually talking about private investment. And then that also links to the level of privatization of activity within that sector and the kind of choices that any given government is making about what is privately managed or financed versus what is publicly managed or financed. And then lastly, the formalization of the sector. There's, it's, and that is particular to developing countries. There's a lot of places where the sector is not necessarily formal. We see that in transport. We see that in energy. And so there's, there's not necessarily even a tracking or an engagement of, of formal fi private finance because the sector itself has not yet been formalized. So I think it's more tho those issues than this kind of division developed versus developing. Jason. Great, so I'm, I'll wrap up quickly. I guess I'll, I'll now step back from the details that we've just gone into. I think, you know, through this initiative, uh, it's been a tremendous learning experience. Um, I mean, the way I, the way I would summarize it, and I think it's, it's embedded in the structure of the report, you know, green growth uh, has to go from being a sort of a special initiative to a sort of way of life, right? Um, the, to do it right, it requires you know, framing a broad set of benefits. It requires thinking through uh, an analysis of the trade-offs and the, and the synergies. And then it requires that to go all the way through. How is your fiscal, uh, how are your uh, fiscal policy and fiscal instruments established? What kind of funding mechanisms do you have? How do you monitor and evaluate? How do you build capabilities? The, it's very clear that, that uh, what's required for green growth is, is a, a real change in, in the way we look at, at development. Um, and you know, where are we? I think the case studies point to the fact that we're, we're starting to launch away from just being a special initiative. It's no longer just something that ministries of environment uh, do. It's, it's increasingly getting to be mainstream, and we're increasingly seeing um, examples that are at scale of, of policies and programs uh, that are, that are uh, taking, taking off. And it's, it's, it's heartening to see that. It's humili hu uh, a little bit humbling to recognize how much farther uh, we still have to go. Uh, and a lot of that's, you know, reflected in the fact that none of us could answer the question about inflation. <laughs> I don't really know if any central banks have even thought about that question yet. Um, they may have, but it's not something that's out there in the public domain. Mm -hmm. When this thing is, you know, when we're really a way of life, I, I think we'll probably all know that answer right off the top of our heads. Mm -hmm. um, the, so now stepping back from the world to this report, um, you know, g in that context, I think uh, this has to be a continual learning experience. Um, Mistakes have been made by countries. Um, the only way it's worked is when uh, they've uh, learned from those and then reshape policy over time. I mean, all of our case studies point to the fact that there has to be an ongoing learning experience about how to do this. And uh, I think the hope for, for this initiative is that um, we do have continuity, uh, bridging back to past initiatives, but now moving forward and creating a platform for, for ongoing learning. I mean, as a, as a group of practitioners in this room and, and, and uh, uh, I guess, uh, dialed in remotely, um, you know, in a way, it's our job to uh, continue this uh, in a in a way that builds on what we've learned in the past and, and creates um, uh, better policies, better standards, and um, and uh, moves forward uh, on that. So, you know, from our point of view, uh, we're looking for feedback. This is a, a living document, and we want people to become a part of it. We'd like to see the broader practitioner community engaging in it and helping move it forward because um, it needs to still move forward. This is a, is a story still being told. Um, so feedback is, is very welcome. Uh, the document and some additional backup materials on the case studies will be available, and we will be uh, looking for ways to, to uh, integrate input and, and to uh, improve the document uh, over time. Um, you know, finally, we're, we're very keen to begin doing outreach. We've begun, and um, Sam may mention one or two examples, uh, to, to reach out through a number of organizations and with a number of countries, and we're keen to do that uh, in the next 12 months. It's only through really testing this and seeing what people need to know and where, they're, where the case studies are sufficient and where they need more, a better and deeper understanding of, of, of the, the, the opportunities that we'll be able to make this uh, truly effective. Um, and that, that goes all in the spirit of what I think has been an extraordinarily collaborative effort. Um, 
uh, both Ron and, and, and uh, Sam went, at, went into lots of detail about the many partners we've had in this initiative. Um, we'd like to see that uh, continue going forward. Uh, this is the kind of joint effort I think that's, that's really worthwhile um, and we've, we've truly only just begun. Yeah. Okay, well look, thank you very much indeed, Jason. I mean, Ron, is there anything to add to that on what happens next? I think it's very clear there's an invitation for you uh, here in the room and those online. It's, it's great, actually. It's heartening to see where the questions have come from. We've had questions from Africa, mm. Asia, and Latin America. There's a lot of interest in this. Um, so we don't intend to stop here. I think that's the collective <laughs> message. And we'd like to hear from you demands for sharing this, presenting this, doing the next the next thing that needs to be done. I mean, Ron, is there anything to add that hasn't been said on, on the outreach? Um, just really briefly, just to reinforce that point, please do let us know how we can make the results most useful to you and to partners you, you work with. Um, we, we're very keen to provide assistance. Um, the online handbook will be available July 14th. We'll advertise that. We're glad to add additional cases or examples, so feel free to share information. We're going forward with our country outreach outreach to international development assistance agencies, presentations at workshops and events where we can, so let us know if such opportunities exist or through webinars. And of course, interested in feedback on, on ongoing research. So um, the more we hear from you, the better. And, and uh, we, as Jason's mentioned, we have this great team of partners, so there's a lot of opportunity to, to build on that network and collaboration. And just while I have the mic, I want to thank Sam and Caroline and others at CDK and an ODI for, for hosting us here and everybody in, in the audience. Thank you. Bert, last word. Um, keep, keep it short. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, really keeping it short. Uh, one thing is on, on the question, uh, how are we doing actually? Uh, how is Green Growth actually making a difference? Uh, there is an interesting OECD report just out, Green Growth Indicators 2014. There you find data about decoupling, etc. So you, that was not the, the purpose of, of this exercise to really do that, but there are others uh, taking care of it. Other than, than that, just one thing say, uh, saying that uh, and I feel even more proud uh, after this exercise, seeing so much uh, useful material coming through the interest across the world and it made me uh, a little more optimistic that uh, this green growth uh, thinking will really get to a point will get mainstream to and, and get to a critical mass of people and countries that that will really make a difference in for instance in dealing with climate change where we are not that successful but if we can change the mindset of people with this, uh, this uh, framing, I think we have a good chance. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Bert. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for participating. And now you're invited to enjoy some lunch and continue the conversations. Thank you very much. Thank you.